I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lynn Marie Trotty. Uh, Dr. Trotty is an associate professor of neurology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she is currently funded by the National Institutes of Health and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation as the principal investigator of two clinical trials investigating treatments for hypersomnolence. A longtime contributor to the foundation, she was the recipient of the Hypersomnia Foundation's Impact Award in 2020. Let's have her get this conference started with a talk about current and upcoming treatments. Thank you, Dr. Shadi. Thanks. Ooh, thanks so much. I guess I'm also wirelessly mic, so I don't need to talk about mic. Um, good morning, everybody. I am so glad to be here. I'm sure everybody's going to say this, but I'm so glad to be here in person, but also for the hybrid folks, so, so glad that all of you are here uh, remotely. So um, I don't know what happened to my slides. All I can see is the video of myself. There we go. That's much better. Thank you. Um, I will jump right in. I'm going to talk about the current treatment landscape. What is it, you know, what do you do when you're diagnosed with a hypersomnia? Is that... Is there a lot of feedback from that mic, or am I just hearing it here? All right, I'm going to step this way. If you can't hear me, let me know. Um, just uh, for what it's worth, I don't have any financial conflicts um, about this talk, but I do have a few disclosures. I'm a board member of the AASM um, and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation. Um, please don't interpret any of my comments as being official statements other than things that are officially policies of those organizations. And also, I will discuss use of medications that are not FDA approved for what I am discussing them for, because that is the world we live in with idiopathic hypersomnia. So here's what I hope to talk about in these 40 minutes. FDA approvals of medications, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's treatment guidelines for providers about here are the medicines we recommend you use based on the evidence, and then just a sneak preview about how to personalize treatment because when we have more than one medicine to choose from, we have, have some options and some decisions to make. So there's now a pretty robust list of medicines that are FDA approved for the treatment of narcolepsy. Um, this is exciting. Uh, it could be longer, but you know, it's, it's good that we have what we have. And I start with the talk about FDA-approved treatments for narcolepsy because many of these medicines we also use for idiopathic hypersomnia because we suspect that if you treat sleepiness, you can treat sleepiness. None of these medicines are specifically targeting anything specifically to do with either kind of narcolepsy. So we tend to use them in both narcolepsy disorders and idiopathic hypersomnia. But in any case, here's sort of like the big picture landscape of what's FDA approved for narcolepsy. There's three medicines that are, are wake-promoting medications through the dopamine or the dopamine and norepinephrine system in the brain. They're not all three in the same family, but I kind of lump them together in my head. These are modafinil and armodafinil, which are very closely related and then solreamphetol, which is a, a different medication. Then there's a group of medicines we often think of as ADHD medication. These are amphetamine-based medications. Um, there are now two, maybe soon more than two, uh, medications that work uh, on the GABA-B system in the brain. These are medicines that are taken at bedtime, uh, sodium oxabate, and what I will probably refer to as lower sodium oxabate. Um, because its true name is the mouthful that you see there. And we'll talk more about those. And then a medicine that works on totally different brain chemistry. It works on the histamine system to wake people up called patolasant. So a number of choices for narcolepsy, which is great. This is the slide for idiopathic hypersomnia. It looks a little sad, I'll grant you, that long list, this one medicine, but... For like my whole career until August of last year, this slide was just blank. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm taking it as a good sign. There is now one medicine on this list. We really, really deeply hope that this list gets longer. Um, but it was a, a huge milestone that the FDA approved the first treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia last August. And certainly all very, very happy about that. And that was this lower sodium oxidate. So because there's one FDA-approved medication for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia, and because it's so newly approved for idiopathic hypersomnia, I want to start there and really dig into that class of medications. 
And I keep talking about, about, talking about it as a medication class, because while there's two medications, there's sodium oxabate and lower sodium oxabate, the key part there in terms of the effect on symptoms is oxabate. So they have the same active ingredient, one just has a lot less salt than the other, a lot less sodium than the other. So these are medicines that are interesting because what we want to do is wake people up during the day, right, and help with other hypersomnia and narcolepsy symptoms during the day, but they're actually dosed at bedtime. And for people who can wake up and take a second dose, two and a half to four hours later, they're dosed again in the middle of the night. Sodium oxabate is not new. Sodium oxabate has been FDA approved for narcolepsy since 2002. So this is a, oxabates themselves have been around for 20 years. Um, what is new with sodium oxabate is it finally got a pediatric approval only about four years ago. Not FDA approved sodium oxabate for idiopathic hypersomnia ever. The problem with sodium oxabate, as the name sort of suggests, is the sodium. Sodium is bad for a variety of conditions like high blood pressure and heart disease. Um, and so there is now this formulation that instead of just using sodium, uses calcium and magnesium and potassium and all these other things in addition to sodium. Um, and this is what lower sodium oxabate is. And so it was FDA approved for narcolepsy first, shockingly, um, in 2020. Um, but then for IH just a year later, so very rapid um, follow on and for the FDA approval in IH, also approved for kids with narcolepsy, also in 2020. So two different currently available preparations of oxabate, one with more sodium, one with less, only one approved for IH. And then I sort of alluded to the fact that there might soon be a third preparation of oxabate, um, which is to say there is a once nightly form of oxabate that instead of having to take it at bedtime and then wake up four hours later to take the second dose, you just take it at night and it would last all night, um, which has been studied. The studies are published, they look good, um, but uh, the FDA has not um, approved it yet. They haven't not approved it. We're just waiting to hear about that. So keep posted about that. I do want to talk a little bit about the idiopathic hypersomnia lower sodium oxabate trial, mostly because I am a clinical trial nerd, um, but also I think it's helpful in understanding what do the results mean and how does it relate to other medicines that we use for idiopathic hypersomnia. So they used a really interesting study design. So usually when we do a clinical trial, or at least the majority of clinical trials, you sort of have two groups at the beginning. One group gets your new drug, one group gets placebo, you follow them both over time. Nobody knows who gets which until the end, and you see who does better. That's not what they did with the lower sodium oxabate study. What they did with the lower sodium oxabate was put everybody on lower sodium oxabate. Everybody knew they were getting it, everybody got it, and they took it for about 12 to 14 weeks, depending on their situation. And so three months on lower sodium oxabate, knowing that everybody's on lower sodium oxabate, and then they did the part where they randomly assigned people to either the drug or the placebo and nobody knew what they were on. And so after people have been taking the drug for months, then they either stayed on the drug or they were taken off the drug and put on placebo. So a little bit different because I think people have a bit of a better sense of whether they stayed on the drug or went to placebo when that change happens. But also it means that when you're reading the study, they talk about worsening of symptoms rather than improvement of symptoms, which is again the opposite of what we expect. So who is in this trial? I think this also matters because not every trial is totally representative of everybody with a disease. And so anytime you're looking at a trial, you want to think, is, would this study have included me? <laughs> Does this information include someone like me? And so they started out with 154 adults with IH, which is a good size study in IH. On average, there are about 39, 70% women, um, and people had to be sleepy. That Epworth, how likely are you to doze off in different situations, questionnaire had to be at least 11. Or if people were already on sodium oxabate and it was working well, they could be in this trial. It was really a mix of people who were brand new to IH treatment and people who were already on IH treatment that was not working well. 
And so 41% of people had never been treated before, but the majority of people were on something and they were still sleepy. This unfortunately is not uncommon. Our treatments, although we have some, are not perfect, and so it's not all that unusual for people to have residual symptoms. So really their question was, can you use this by itself, or can you use this as an add-on to something that you're taking that's not quite good enough? Most of those people were on sort of traditional stimulants, weight-promoting medications. As with every clinical trial, they had a long list of exclusions. They try to keep people in trials to be as sort of cleanly just one thing as possible. Um, but So people couldn't have any other cause of sleepiness. Um, people could not have had depression within the last year, which I highlight just because, unfortunately, depression is a really common comorbidity of hypersomnia and narcolepsy. Um, and then because this medicine is very sedating, people could not be taking any sedating medications or use alcohol or cannabinoids. And I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of the like who started and what happened to all the people. This is what this study is. I think the one thing that I want to highlight in this is they started out with 154 people. And remember, they put everybody on lower sodium oxalate. Everybody knew they were taking it. About three and a half months later, they did the randomization. Some people stayed on drugs, some people went to placebo part. In that three month period, about 25% of people left the study. They didn't all leave the study because they didn't like the medicine. They didn't all leave the study because of side effects. People leave clinical trials for all kinds of reasons, right? They move or their cat dies or what have you. Um, but it means that the study was really testing the effect in the three quarters of people who hadn't already dropped out of the study. So this is it in a nutshell. I'm going to walk you through this. The top thing, oop, no, I'm not. Um, is there a pointer on here? There's not a pointer on here. OK. Well, I'm going to gesture a lot with my hands then. So <laughs> the bar on the top, uh, the figure on the top, what you're looking at on the y-axis there is the Epworth. And so higher scores are worse on the Epworth. And so in the part before you see the shading, that's when people were taking it for those three months where everybody knew they were taking it. And so what you see is, on average, people get better, right? This helps with, <laughs> this helps with sleepiness. Um, and then the blue shading is the two weeks they held everybody's dose stable right before they did the randomization. And then the purple is where you see the lines separate. And that's because the dark blue line within that purple shading, those are the people who were changed back to placebo. So what this tells you is if you stay on the drug for those extra two weeks, your sleepiness stays about the same. But if you are suddenly changed to a placebo, your sleepiness gets a lot worse again. It goes back to essentially what it was to start out with. So this is telling us this drug definitely helps more than placebo at treating sleepiness, which is great news. I think it was an unexpected, it was an expected finding because we knew that it does this in narcolepsy, but it was great to see this in an IH population. This drug does help with sleepiness for people with IH. What you're looking at on the bottom with all those horizontal bars is they looked at different types of people or situations within the trial to see if some people did better than others in terms of their sleepiness. And so they looked at uh, men and women and did not see a difference. They pretty much responded about the same to the medication. They looked at people who took it twice a night, which was the majority of patients, and people who only took it once a night because they just could not wake up for that second dose. Um, and while statistically they were the same, you can see sort of numerically the two-dose people did better than the one-dose people. They also looked to see if there was a difference for the people who sleep really, really long with IH, for the people with more normal sleep durations, and maybe a suggestion that the long sleep people did better, although again, not statistically significant, um, and not really a big difference between people who are already on a medicine and people who are not. They did not just look at sleepiness. That's another great thing about this trial. This is the thing that I think we need in all IH trials is not just to look at sleepiness, but to look at the symptoms more broadly because of course hypersomnia is not just sleepiness. And so they used a scale from Yves Duvalier, who's speaking I think tomorrow, called the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale that's really a scale that addresses all the different symptoms of idiopathic hypersomnia and their severity in people. And that, that scale got better, or I should say, got worse in the people randomized to placebo. So it was better with drug than placebo. 
the patient global impression of change scale is a, just a question for people in the trial. Are you a little better? Are you much better? Are you very much better? Are you a little worse? And so on. Um, and those scales were better with drug than placebo. And then the functional outcomes of sleepiness questionnaire is a questionnaire that asks people not just like how sleepy are you, but what in your life is impacted by your sleepiness? What can't you do because you're too sleepy to do it? And that also showed a change. They used just to like draw a line on this scale to say how hard it is to wake up in the morning, um, but that also Im improved with drug versus placebo. So bottom line, people's sleepiness improved, but also their other hypersomnia symptoms improved as well. So really good news from this IH trial. Um, all drugs have risk, uh, including this one, um, and so important to think about the safety data as well. I realize there's, this is riddled with acronyms. TEAE stands for Treatment Emergent Adverse Events, which means something happened during the treatment, uh, a side effect, essentially. They had a whole bunch of mild stuff, which is in keeping with what we know about this drug. It caused some nausea, it caused some headache, it caused some dizziness, it caused some anxiety. Um, and then um, 77 moderately severe um, events, one severe, but it was not related to the study medication. Similarly, four people had serious things, because serious and severe are different in clinical trials, um, but also judged to be unrelated. Over the whole course of the study, 17% of people stopped the drug because of a side effect that started when they were on the medication. So a little higher than we might see with some other drugs, but not terrible, certainly for a drug that works well. Um, about half of those were psychiatric. So we do, uh, with Cyram, tend to see, excuse me, with Oxybate, tend to see things like um, worsening of anxiety, sometimes worsening of depression. And so about half of the reasons people dropped out were because of psychiatric side effects. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna change gears and, and move away from Oxybate specifically and talk about sort of bigger picture, what is the treatment landscape? And um, I'm gonna talk about this through a clinical practice guideline um, that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine puts out. Um, Professional societies put these out. They basically have a group of experts look at all the data that's published in the literature and then make recommendations about what drugs work, what drugs shouldn't be used, what drugs might be used someday to sort of guide doctors and other providers in knowing which medicines to use for which condition. So we did one of these for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, a couple of years ago. We made recommendations by diagnosis and in the case of narcolepsy by age. Um, for adults with narcolepsy, it's basically the list of medicines that I showed you on the, these are the FDA approved medications um, because those medicines got FDA approved for narcolepsy because they had evidence in support of their use. What you see in the second column there, the strong and conditional, has to do with whether the recommendation was, yes, this is definitely a drug people should use for this disorder because we know it works, we know the benefits outweigh the harms, or conditional means it's probably still a good choice, but it's less clear that the benefits and the harms, um, that the benefits outweigh the harms, or there's less evidence in support of its use. And so interestingly, you see some conditional recommendations, even for drugs that are FDA approved for narcolepsy. Um, and that's because either in the case of dextroamphetamine and methylphenidate, they've just been around for so long and standards have sort of changed that nobody's doing huge studies of these medicines now because they're generic and so on. Um, and armodafinil because it sort of was close enough to, to modafinil, it didn't have the same uh, evidence base. In pediatrics for narcolepsy, um, two recommendations. Um, so a smaller list, because unfortunately there aren't as many studies in kids, and so there's less to guide decision-making, but modafinil and uh, sodium oxybate. One of our, Kira Maskey, um, who is a great, great pediatric neurologist um, who does a lot of narcolepsy work, was the chair of this task force, and, and really her, guiding principle in doing this was in disorders where there's less data, 
We want to make sure that we like wring every piece of useful clinical information out of the available data that we can, and not just have a document that says, here's how you treat narcolepsy in adults, we don't know how to treat anything else, um, because that's not useful for people trying to treat these disorders today. And so that's why we made recommendations for pediatric narcolepsy, and that's why you see this list of five medicines for idiopathic hypersomnia. So. It's pretty clear that modafinil works for idiopathic hypersomnia. We made a strong recommendation for modafinil in idiopathic hypersomnia, and I'll show you the evidence for that in a minute. Um, but couldn't make any other strong recommendations for modafinil, uh, for idiopathic hypersomnia. So all the other recommendations in idiopathic hypersomnia are sort of this lower, we think they probably are a good idea, but we don't have all the evidence that we need sort of level of recommendation. Um, for, for as you see there, four, four drugs, clarithromycin, methylphenidate, pitolosant, and sodium oxybate. And so I will walk through those recommendations. Modafinil is a non-amphetamine wake-promoting medication um, that has been used for idiopathic hypersomnia for a long time. It's been FDA approved for narcolepsy for a long, long time. Um, never FDA approved for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, but now there have been two randomized controlled trials just in people with idiopathic hypersomnia um, testing modafinil. Um, almost everybody had the form of idiopathic hypersomnia where they did not sleep more than 10 or 11 hours at night. Um, and what you're looking at here is the two different studies are in green, that's sort of their average effect on the Epworth, and then the black diamond at the bottom is the average effect weighted across the two studies. Um, and so you see that compared to placebo, and this is sort of a more traditional, half the people start on modafinil, half the people start on placebo, you get a pretty similar, actually, reduction in the Epworth as what we saw in the lower sodium oxybate trial. And so modafinil works for this measure of sleepiness. Both studies also used a test called the maintenance of wakefulness test, which I don't know if anybody's had the pleasure of doing one of those tests. They're sort of horrible, but we use them in clinical trials because they're a good way to get at the data that we need, but you basically sit in a dimly lit room for 40 minutes four times over the course of the day and try to stay awake. So it's like the evil twin of the multiple sleep latency test that we use for diagnosis, which has its own evilness um, as well. So in any case, when you give people modafinil, they get better at staying awake in the dimly lit room for 40 minutes four times a day um, by about five minutes. So we, we also believe pretty strongly that modafinil is effective for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. It is often my first line drug for people with idiopathic hypersomnia and people with narcolepsy for that matter. Um, an important caveat, I think, and I suspect we would see this with other hypersomnia treatments if anybody did the study, so I don't think this is a modafinil problem, but it has been studied in modafinil. Uh, which is, this was a study looking at driving safety. So they put people on the road and had them drive for two hours and looked at how many times they crossed the dotted line. Um, and they did that without medicine. And then they did that on modafinil. And this was a mixture of IH and narcolepsy patients. And what they found was, without medicines, people who are sleepy have more driving impairment. But even on modafinil, although they were much better, and not a modafinil, they were still worse than people without a sleep disorder. Um, and so we think a lot about safety, I think, in the treatment of hypersomnia and narcolepsy. Our medicines are good. They may not totally uh, remove some of these risks. A brief moment about modafinil versus armodafinil. So modafinil is two mirror image compounds. And R modafinil is the R, the right handed version of that. Um, which means they are very, very similar but not identical. Um, the biggest difference tends to be that uh, people who take modafinil usually have to split the dosing, take some of the dose in the morning and some of the dose around lunchtime, whereas people who take R modafinil can usually get away with just taking it once in the morning, which is a lot more convenient, um, but otherwise very similar. Nobody has done and probably nobody will do armodafinil studies in idiopathic hypersomnia, but I'm reasonably, I'm very comfortable extrapolating from the modafinil data that armodafinil is probably really good for idiopathic hypersomnia as well. Um, one of the things that 
we see with uh, medicines for idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy is what we see in the clinical trial is helpful, but it's not the whole story, right? We also want to know for people who are taking this, like in their day-to-day -day lives to uh, as their treatment, how long do people stay on the medicines, right? It's one thing if it's great in the clinical trial, but then everybody has to stop it as soon as they try to use it at home for some reason. Um, and so the clinical series of people with idiopathic hypersomnia, people who sort of publish, like, I treated 100 people in my clinic and here's what happened kind of thing, about two-thirds of people with IH who start on modafinil stay on it for the long term. And so we sure would love to see numbers closer to 100 on that metric. We do not ever see close numbers of 100 on that measure. Um, but for two-thirds of people, it's probably a pretty good drug. So back to now, so that was the strong recommendation for idiopathic hypersomnia. Everybody pretty much agrees modafinil is good for idiopathic hypersomnia. What about these conditional recommendations? So they are in alphabetical order here, and so that's the order I'm going to address them in. So first is clarithromycin, um, which is an antibiotic um, that uh, we started using at Emory quite a number of years ago on the theory that there may be a problem of the GABA system in people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and related disorders. And so we did a clinical trial funded by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation um, quite a number of years ago. It was just 20 people. It was really just to say, do we have a sense that this drug works or not? So half of people got clarithromycin and then placebo, and half of people got placebo and then clarithromycin. So again, a little bit of a different study design. Um, and we were hoping that what we would see was that people's reaction time would speed up, that people would get better at a reaction time task. We did not see that. What we did see was that people's Epworth scores got better, um, as well as a variety of other questionnaires. And so the recommendation is not a strong recommendation. We don't make strong recommendations based on clinical trials that are very, very small. We definitely need more data to know if clarithromycin works or not. Shout out to my ongoing clinical trial, if anyone would, <laughs> would like to be in the Atlanta area for a few weeks and be in it. Um, we are trying to collect more data uh, on this question right now. Um, I personally reserve the use of clarithromycin to people in whom other things have been tried and did not work because of its uh, status as an antibiotic, which raises a whole host of issues. Um, but for some people, it may be the right medicine for right now. Methylphenidate, um, the data for this in idiopathic hypersomnia, there are no clinical trials. There are just clinical series. Again, people saying like, well, I saw these patients in my clinic and here's what happened. Um, with methylphenidate, about 41% of people who started on it in this one series stayed on it. Some of those people had already tried and failed modafinil, and so it maybe looks a little worse than it is. For the other amphetamine-based stimulants, um, amphetamine dextro, amphetamine combinations, or dextroamphetamine alone, the percentages are even smaller, as are the sample sizes. Um, we're also shout out. I'm just, just going to shout out clinical trials throughout this talk, um, and also I'll go ahead and shout out the clinical trial session later on in this meeting for anyone who wants to know more about being in clinical trials. But this is how we figure out what works for people, so they're pretty important. We are doing a clinical trial right now of comparing amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, and modafinil to try to figure out which is better, um, rather than just doing studies that compare medicines uh, to placebo, comparing directly to each other. There is a conditional recommendation for patolasant. So this is a relatively new medication. It was FDA approved for narcolepsy in 2019. It works on the histamine system. So if you think about how antihistamines like Benadryl tend to make people sleepy, this is a drug that increases histamine in the brain, which helps wake people up. Um, this is the data from the narcolepsy clinical trial where they compared it to placebo, which is the blue line, and also modafinil. So they compared it to basically the gold standard and found a very similar effect with patolasan and, and the current gold standard on Epworth sleepiness severity scales. Um, this is the only drug that's FDA approved for the treatment of narcolepsy that is not a controlled substance. Um, and so that is important for people with a history of abuse um, or a strong family history and so on. Um, what about patolosan for idiopathic hypersomnia? Um, what we know about patolosan for idiopathic hypersomnia so far comes from a clinical series of patients um, from France, from the great Isabel Arnulf and her group, um, where 
in people with idiopathic hypersomnia who had failed all existing available treatments in France, so people who had really bad IH that just didn't respond to medications, about a third of people got better on patolosant. So I suspect if they had done this in people who were like brand new to diagnosis or had only failed one medication, these numbers would look probably better than this. Um, but even in people who failed three other medications, patolosant still helped in a third of people. And so encouraging, I will shout out the patolosant for IH clinical trial now, not ours, but um, patolosant is being evaluated for idiopathic hypersomnia, which is really good. My deep, deep hope is now that the first drug has been FDA approved for idiopathic hypersomnia, um, our colleagues in industry will see that idiopathic hypersomnia is a uh, disorder that should be studied, that there is a way forward for them with drug, uh, drug development in idiopathic hypersomnia because we need more, uh, we need more trials in IH and we need more drugs. So, sorry. I can't give a talk like this without accidentally tripping on my own soapboxes, so apologies for that. Um, but Tolosant being studied is very exciting. My slides will no longer advance. Okay. So that was the list of what we recommended for idiopathic hypersomnia, except on the list of idiopathic hypersomnia, the last drug on that list that was recommended was sodium oxalate, which was given a conditional recommendation. That's because when we made these recommendations, the lower sodium oxalate trial had not been published yet. Um, and so uh, it was unfortunate timing, um, but we talked about oxybate for idiopathic hypersomnia, and so uh, that is also certainly an option at this point. I just wanted to circle back, back briefly to the adult narcolepsy uh, recommendations, because the one drug on this list we have not talked about so far in our uh, uh, journey through medications for hypersomnia is solriamfetol. Solriamfetol is also a fairly new medication. It was FDA approved for narcolepsy in 2019. It is not FDA approved for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, I don't have a solriamfetol in idiopathic hypersomnia controlled trial to shout out to you to go be part of because as far as I know, no one is doing that study, although I deeply, deeply wish somebody would. Um, but anyway, here's the data in narcolepsy. Um, what you're looking at on the top is again that, um, actually let me direct you to the bottom first. The bottom is the Epworth. So if you're hearing a theme, it's that in clinical trials, we always ask people to do that, like how likely are you to doze off in these routine activity scale. And what you see from white to yellow to purple to blue is increasing doses of solriamfetol. The more you take, the better it works for sleepiness. On the top, you're looking at the maintenance of wakefulness test, that 40 minutes, four times a day, stay awake in a boring place. Um, people got better at staying awake with solriamfetol. Um, and so this has been FDA approved for narcolepsy, not at the blue dose, but at the yellow and purple doses. Um, we don't have any data in idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, we are sometimes able to obtain it off-label for people with idiopathic hypersomnia. My sense is it's going to be a pretty good drug for idiopathic hypersomnia, so I wish somebody would do that uh, trial. In any case, um, the mainstay of treatment for hypersomnia and narcolepsy at this moment in time really is medications, and that's why all of my talk um, up to this point has been about medications. Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind that the treatment is not only medications, or at least maybe the treatment won't always be only medications. Um, there, there may be a role for other aspects of symptom management. And so I believe Dr. Ong is speaking this weekend as well at this conference. Um, this is work from Jason Ong's group trying to develop a kind of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy for hypersomnia. So in the sleep world, we use a kind of talk therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy um, for insomnia all the time. It's like the gold standard for treating insomnia. Um, it really hasn't been looked at for hypersomnia. It's not going to work the same way that it does for people with insomnia. But the idea is there are probably things, um, both behaviorally and cognitively, there are skills and uh, behaviors that people can learn that might help with coping with a chronic disease that has sometimes devastating impacts on daily functioning. And so they worked on developing um, this, uh, this treatment modality, which they did for six weeks 
once, once a week. And this was just a preliminary sort of let's do the study to see if it's going to help or not. Not the definitive study, but they did see some improvements um, in depressive symptoms and in a measure of, of uh, global self-efficacy, basically people's own sense of their ability to manage everything going on. Um, and so really encouraging, uh, something to watch moving forward, um, and a talk to listen to tomorrow, I believe. And then in my last few minutes, I just want to think about, um, you know, now that we have more than one medicine, whether your diagnosis is idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy, we have some options, we have these recommendations, we have studies that compare everything to placebo. How do we go from sort of that list to, okay, for this person, how do we decide together what is the right medicine for each person? I think we have a long way to go in personalizing uh, treatment decisions. It would be great if we could just like do a blood test and be like, oh, you'll be a super responder to Oxybate. You should have that. Or, oh, no, you should have modafinil. We're very, very far from that. But there are lots of factors that, that come into play when deciding which medication is best. Um, there's not sort of a one-size-fits-all. And Dr. Morse is speaking this weekend as well, and she's going to talk more about this idea of, you know, how do we work together as a team, doctor and patient, to figure out for each person what is, what is the best. So shout out to her talk as well. I do think this is just a list of some of the things to think about. Diagnosis does matter because probably we will find that some drugs work better for narcolepsy type 1, say, than idiopathic hypersomnia or vice versa. Um, but also, unfortunately, for insurance, your diagnosis matters. Um, I do think we are moving to a world where we're not just saying, how do we fix sleepiness, but how do we fix the whole thing? Right, so for people with narcolepsy type 1, how do we also fix the cataplexy? For people with IH, how do we fix the great difficulties in waking up in the morning or the long sleeps, so on. Um, what has already been tried and what has happened with those medications can give us clues about what to do next. The strength of the evidence, everything I started out with those guidelines, what do the clinical trials tell us about benefit and harm? There are a lot of medication interactions for a lot of these medications, and so depending on what else people are taking, that can really impact our choice of therapy, as can other diagnoses. Um, I hate that cost and insurance coverage is on this list. That's another soapbox I'll just, I'll just step away from. Um, and then, of course, preferences, right? Like some people aren't going to remember a twice-a-day medication. They really need a once-a-day medication. Sometimes people like a nighttime medicine. Sometimes they like a daytime medication. There's lots of other factors that, um, that go into that as well. Um, this is here not because I really want to get into the nitty-gritty of the package inserts for prescribing any of these medications, but just to say it is really common for people with idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy to have more than one thing, right? Like people don't just have one disease. People often have comorbid mood disorders, anxiety or depression or what have you. People often have comorbid medical disorders. And so those absolutely guide our choice of uh, what medication to use because some of these medications can impact those other diagnoses. So we have to think about um, what those other uh, mental health diagnoses might be and what those other medical diagnoses might be. Particularly, a lot of these drugs have uh, impacts on the heart in various ways, but also lung diseases and seizures and even glaucoma. So um, there really there has to be a, a personalization based on those other disorders. Um, and then there's going to be a session on this too. <laughs> I can, my whole talk is just telling you to go see, see other people talk during this conference. Um, but, uh, but this is a really important issue, is that um, people of childbearing potential or people on hormonal therapy, um, these medications have really important impacts. So none of the medicines are known to be safe in pregnancy. Some of them we are pretty sure are not safe in pregnancy. Um, so we like to have a conversation, preferably before someone tries to get pregnant, about what is the plan. Um, some people come off medications entirely for the duration of their pregnancy. For some people, that is not necessarily the best option because, of course, while there's risks of medications, there's also risks of being unmedicated for long periods of time. 
Um, and so that's a really important thing to talk through uh, with medication choice. Breastfeeding, also an issue because many of these medicines get into breast milk, although these are usually studies based on like three people, so there's not a lot of evidence to know exactly what to do there. And then importantly, modafinil, armodafinil, and pitolisant can all reduce um, the efficacy of hormonal treatments. So this includes things like birth control to prevent pregnancy, um, but also things like testosterone therapy, gender-affirming care. Um, and so it's important for people who are on hormonal treatments to talk through what that interaction looks like. Can they still continue that and use, say, a barrier method to prevent pregnancy, or do they need to use a different medication? So that is important as well. With that, I see I have 13 seconds left on my timer, and I am done. So... <laughs> And I believe I have five minutes for questions. Uh, when you say birth control, do you mean like a birth control pill, or is it also like the implant IUD? So it is any birth control whose mechanism is based on their hormones. So it is the implant, it is the hormonal ring, it is the birth control pill. All of those release hormones into your system. And then what the interaction actually is, is that the medicines speed up the metabolism of those hormones. So your body destroys the hormones too quickly, so they don't stick around long enough to prevent pregnancy. IUDs are different, so implantable uterine devices are different because although they have hormones with them, their action is primarily that they are sitting in the uterus and they make the uterus a bad place to be. And so um, they prevent pregnancy even if they don't have any hormones in them. The hormones are actually often there to reduce some of the side effects from having the IUD, like less bleeding and, and so on. And so IUDs are a great choice for people who are on modafinil, armodafinil, or, or patolosant for pregnancy prevention. I have a whole nother soapbox about IUDs, but I'll really try to stay away from that one. Because they're great. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Oh, Mike. Janet, take it away. Put your hand up again. Uh, yeah. No, I don't really want to picture things. Um, why did uh, flumazenil come off your list? It doesn't seem like you guys discussed that. So flumazenil is another drug that we um, have uh, worked with at Emory for a long time. Um, we use still at Emory quite a bit, as well as other places for people who have hypersomnia that does not respond well to other therapies. We did look for it for the, um, the treatment guideline uh, for the AASM, but uh, basically to be included, there were specific criteria about how many people with each diagnosis were in each study. Um, and so we looked at those, um, but basically there wasn't enough evidence to make a recommendation either way. And so for, for flumazenil, if you actually go and read the nitty gritty documents, it does talk about the evidence for flumazenil, but ultimately there wasn't a strong enough evidence base to make a recommendation because unlike clarithromycin, where there's a published clinical trial, there isn't a published clinical trial for flumazenil. Um, and so uh, it was really just came down to, we don't know enough yet to say for sure about flumazenil in a document like that. That happened a lot in narcolepsy treatments, actually. Lots of things are used for these disorders where there's not a ton of data. So I'm glad you raised that question because I usually think to say this, and I forgot to say it today, just because something is not in a treatment guideline doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. The only drugs we think doctors shouldn't use are drugs that in the guideline it says, don't use this drug, right, because we know that it's harmful. There's lots of things that we use, especially for diseases where we don't have a lot of options that don't have enough data to make the treatment guidelines, but still might be helpful for people in whom the standard treatments don't work. Um, we have a online question. Uh, what suggestions can you offer doctors treating patients with narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia, particularly from a drug or dosing perspective, regarding medications that improve nightly sleep with a focus towards reducing sleep inertia or next day grogginess? Okay, 
So, um, the... Two words let you write really long questions. <laughs> So, um, so, so yeah, so for people with narcolepsy, especially narcolepsy type 1, fragmented sleep at night can be a really big problem. Um, and so often in, in people with that issue, we want to think about not just waking people up at night, uh, during the day, but helping people sleep better at night as well. Um, and it turns out that, you know, at least in clinical experience, if you give these people sort of traditional sleeping pills, uh, they tend to like maybe sleep better, but then they have this groggy hangover of the sleeping pill. And so this is one of the ways in which the oxybates are really um, potentially very unique, is that they both help with sleep quality overnight and help with daytime sleepiness the next day. And so for most people, um, there isn't that sort of groggy hungover feeling from oxybates the next day. We do caution people when they start them to make sure they know how it affects them, because you, you can have a little carryover first thing in the morning, but, but most people don't. And so for people with fragmented nocturnal sleep and daytime sleepiness, we do think oxybates are pretty unique in that way. For people who have sleep inertia, for people with IH who may sleep fine at night but really just cannot wake up in the morning, um, we have a few different options. In the, in the lower sodium oxybate for IH trial, they did find a benefit. They did, did find that for people with IH, it was easier for them to wake up in the morning if they took oxybate overnight, and so that is an option. Um, we sometimes use a dose of something wake-promoting at bedtime to help people wake up the next morning. There is a great, in my opinion, um, methylphenidate uh, formulation where, so methylphenidate is a daytime wake you up medication, but there's a formulation for ADHD where you take it at bedtime and it sits in your stomach overnight. It doesn't release overnight. It starts releasing hours later. So it starts releasing into your system around the time you want to wake up. It's like somehow they didn't design this drug specifically for IH, but like I think they accidentally <laughs> you know, develop this drug for IH, um, because that's a really good way to help with sleep inertia, is to have medicine in your system when you're trying to wake up. Um, there's a, a case series from Carlos Schenk using the antidepressant bupropion at bedtime in an extended release to help people wake up the next morning. Um, we sometimes use that. There's a little bit of evidence that melatonin at night can help people with IH wake up in the morning. Um, often what we do, if people have a medicine like modafinil that helps them during the day be awake is dose it before people plan to wake up. So if you need to wake up at 8 and that's when the alarms are supposed to go off, instead of setting the first alarm at 8, set the first alarm at 7. At 7, don't try to get up, just take the modafinil or whatever the wake promoting medication is off the bedside table, swallow it with some water and go back to sleep. And then at 8, have the alarms go off as usual, but then you're trying to wake up with the medicine already in your system as opposed to wake up with no medicine and then take the medicine. So an hour approximately before you need to really wake up, we have a lot of people take their medicine that way to help with the waking up process. Okay, now I'm really out of time, so I'm gonna stop. Thank you all uh, so much for your attention.